All right, here we go. Let me cross fade it over and here I am. Okay, so good morning. Hopefully you can see me okay. Wow, my audio lag is really bad. Sorry, I look at, I'm checking the audio, the lag between my audio and my video and it looks quite, I mean, it's almost a second. Um, maybe I just need to not watch it. <laughs> I mean, maybe it doesn't look too bad whenever you see it. Um, anyway, um, I'm glad you like the intro music. I, I didn't actually have it, so I, I couldn't hear it just now, so I don't know what it is. I just have a playlist that I, I pick up um, uh, randomly, um, lo-fi things, but I'm glad you're, <laughs> glad you're enjoying that. Uh, okay, so if the audio is, sounds bad or the sync looks distracting, please let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to proceed with things for today. Um, hope you all are doing well. It's a nice, uh, pretty sunny day. The sun is kind of coming and going, but it's out right now, at least at my house. So I hope that wherever you are, you get to see some sun as well. Um, the, I don't know, Shanahan, I'm, I'm doing okay. I mean, it seems like it's going for me. Let me just make sure that it's on. It always, okay, let me, I just switched off low latency mode, um, which might improve it. I don't know why it keeps switching that back on. Um, but low latency, so right now I, I just changed it so that it will privilege putting things together for you, um, like getting it to you in a pretty decent like bit rate. Um, with low latency mode, it tries to get it to you as fast as possible and deprioritizes um, you know, the, the delivery. So I don't know why it keeps defaulting to low latency mode. I don't want it ever in low latency mode really because it doesn't matter uh, to me. So um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, if I'm talking to Shane Hand, so I can't, I don't know if you can hear me yet. Um, let me just type uh, in here to Shane Hand. Come on. Um, okay, so oh, okay, looks like it's good now. All right, great. So um, the uh, so here's what we're gonna do today. As you can see, I've got a slideshow up here with some things, and I'm going to actually share with you the link to this slideshow just in case you want to take a look at it. It's not a very detailed like. I mean, it's a lecture, like it's gonna guide the things I talk about, but I wanted to provide it to you in case you wanted to click through it and look at some of the links on your own, um, either now or later. Um, it's only three links, I guess, but it might be useful for you to have those all in one place, so there it is. Um, the, uh, the goals for today, as you can see, are to go over some things related to your webcomic assignment, which is something that you should start um, thinking about, and I wanna get you thinking about it some today. And then I wanna talk about chapter five from Watchmen, which is titled Fearful Symmetry. And as you can see here, I have a number of topics that I wanna to try to cover uh, about chapter five. Um, some things that I, I just kinda wanna show you and invite you to think about, and uh, they, they can come up in discussions later, and I, I'd be interested to see what you do with these. Specifically, I think there are some ways in which the ideas presented in chapter five actually carry over pretty well into chapter six. So I'm going to, one of the things I'm gonna do is prompt you to look for those things when we get to chapter six. Even though chapter six has its own motifs and structures going on, uh, I think they're related pretty closely, and um, yeah, I, just, I want you to think about these things. Uh, okay, so this is, the, the first link here is to the webcomic assignment, so I'm going to take a look at this um, first, and this is something that you are doing in your group. You know your group, obviously, um, you know, Avengers, Defenders, Teen Titans, Justice League, and X-Men, I think. I think that's all of them. Uh, so these... Let me see. Yeah, these are correct. These dates are now correct. They, they were not earlier. I'm just double checking them, but I believe those are now all correct uh, in terms of how you should approach this project. So this is a big project. Uh, it is something that will take some time. And in structuring the assignment with this timeline, I've tried to give you a sense of what things you need to do and give you a sense of the order you should probably do them in uh, to start giving you a sense of the scope for this. Uh, this is a big project. As I keep saying, it's a group project. Um, it is an unusually challenging one, um, but it's something that I think does a lot better as a group than if you were trying to do this individually. Just the scope of producing a webcomic, uh, the work that goes into that is something that um, if, you're, if you're working well together, four people can do much better than one person on their own. So um, yeah, it's a, uh, it, it is a group project though, and you no doubt had different kinds of experiences with group projects, good or bad, and I hope this is a good one. 
I can say that most of the time groups work together well, uh, but I think they, uh, they're more likely to work together well if they kind of follow along with the plan and some, take some of the suggestions that I built into the assignment. Uh, but also I intend to um, meet with you all as a group individually, I mean not individually, like meet with each group uh, to go over your, your ideas and make sure that you have a good understanding of who's doing what. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the structure of this and uh, the first part of it, which is your proposal. Now that proposal is due, um, I just have my schedule up, where did it go? Uh, next Monday. So you have a week to work on this proposal and that should be enough time, I think. So, um, I mean, if you haven't started it yet, you should be fine. Um, but if you have started, that's great too. Uh, so let's take a look at the actual stuff that you're going to be doing. So the goal is to produce a web comic. You're going to publish it for about two weeks and uh, two or three weeks, I guess. What is it? Yeah, about two weeks. I don't know. Um, and the, uh, yeah, two and a half, almost three weeks. So the idea is uh, you're going to publish a, uh, create a narrative that's published over that period uh, regularly, like uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, or something like that. Uh, so long as you have at least six individual pages or posts, uh, however you want to organize that, um, to create your webcomic. Now, how, the way that this is going to work, and like as far as um, hosting it, let me comics.net. So this is a, a web, because this is a web comic, uh, one of the things you need to think about as you prepare your proposal is how are you going to publish this? Uh, it needs to be published on the web for it to be a web comic. And there are main, two main ways that I would suggest you, you do this. Uh, one would be to use some software called Comic Easel. It's actually a, a plugin for WordPress. And I have, um, it, when you use it, it actually restructures your site a lot. So um, this is actually a separate site, a separate WordPress installation from MaryWashaComics.net where you're blogging. Uh, this is where s several groups have found it useful to publish their web comics. And uh, you've got an archive of them too. Um, so you can do, you can use Comic Easel on this site and I can give you um, I guess I can, well, no, I, I can't log in right now because I don't have my password manager synced. Uh, but I can. I will give you a tour of Comic Easel sometime, uh, maybe Wednesday. Uh, or maybe I'll just do a standalone video of that so it's not part of class necessarily, but just to give you a sense of what the back end of Comic Easel looks like. It's pretty, um, it's pretty good, but there's a couple things that aren't obvious as you're using it. Uh, but basically it ends up producing something pretty good. So I, I like it for what it produces. So uh, I'll show you what it looks like whenever you have a site published with Comic Easel. You have a title, you have images, and then you get this navigation down here that's like um, previous, next, last, and so on. And so you can click through and read the comic in order at any point, and you can go previous, next, last uh, to, to browse your way through it. Um, comic Easel is widely used by webcomic publishers. It's a, it's a very um, popular tool that people use and develop for. Um, yes, it is the, the crab comic uh, poof loop That's the one. So uh, that's actually uh, this one here. Give him shell, um, Shelbert the gallant. This is this is it, right? So this is a group's project, and uh, you know I think they did a pretty good job of kind of taking uh, their uh, creating an episodic kind of narrative around this character, and you know you can click through it one at a time and, and read it this way. Um, I will try to show you more examples that are I guess more diverse in terms of. Um, style, let's see. Oh uh, yeah, there's some good ones in here. <laughs> yeah, struggle bus. I'm just remembering some of these. These are pretty funny. Um, some of the, some, I've done this assignment or students have done this assignment for, for many years actually. And so I have a pretty deep archive of uh, web comics produced by students. Let's take a look at Bruce Danger. Um, this is a different style. And I, I think I, I wanted to show you this for the difference in style. Um, this is where they did the art uh, with crayon. Like they literally just drew, like someone did the, um, the line and someone else did the coloring in crayon. Um, and it kind of made sense because this is a story about this um, toddler basically who explores the world. And um, it was based on a student's um, nephew, I think. And so it's pretty cool and a different art style, right? Like that's the main thing I wanted you to see is that you can do lots of different things um, visually. Uh, let's see, Shark Week is another really good one. This is a story of a, a woman and a shark who fall in love. <laughs> and um, as you can see, very accomplished in terms of comic styling and different panel stuff. Um, I mean, it's a nice cartoony style, but like I think a really good use of just uh, 
moment to moment transitions here and then a big kind of breakout panel and it's you know it's a good it's a well structured comic so uh, I'd say this is a good example of how to organize it now I'm showing you some good examples um, I hope you're not intimidated by these I don't want you to think this is what you have to do um, some examples you'll see will be much less uh, I guess uh, accomplished artistically or less you know uh, experimental uh, 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 artistically and that's okay I, I mean the, the whole point of this assignment is to learn about how comics work from a narrative point of view and how you go from the idea in a narrative to the expression of that idea in a comic page. And that does take some work. Um, I can also, th there are lots of different tools you can use to create comics visually, the graphics. I'm not, I, I don't have, I'm not going to endorse a specific tool. Um, I can recommend a few that you can look at and you can find infinite YouTube tutorials for how to use them. Um, I use GIMP for a lot of the things I do. GIMP is not great for comic art. Um, it's, I mean, you can get by with it. Um, if you really like GIMP, same with Photoshop, it's okay, but it's not great for comic art. Um, a lot of people use um, Clip Studio or Medibang, uh, so those are, are tools that you can that have um, that that are oriented towards vector drawing as opposed to bitmaps, which is what Photoshop and GIMP are. And vector drawings are like you can follow the lines. I think I'm pretty sure this was made with uh, vector art, for example. Um, so there's. Uh, uh, it, either Medibang or Clip Studio, one or, one or maybe both of them also has pretty nice features built into it for doing paneling and dialogue bubbles and stuff like that. So it's kind of a software designed around the idea of creating comic art. So that's, it's useful for that. Some of you may already have that or know how to use that. And if that's the case, you're, of course, that's great. So feel free to, to use things you already know uh, if you're comfortable with them uh, and, and that's great. Uh, but okay, so these are the kinds of things you should be talking about in your group. And let me talk about the proposal or the, the structure of your group work. And I've got a suggestion here, like I think most groups are now four. Yeah, I think every, I think every group is actually four at this point in terms of, you know, how many people you have. Maybe five, maybe one's a group of five, I can't remember. Um, but the, uh, that's okay because there are at least four distinct roles that I would suggest uh, that you, you'd occupy. But notice, I, you know, I want to pay special attention to artists. So, I think one of the pitfalls of this assignment sometimes is that a group will recognize that one member of the group has some artistic talent or interest in drawing the, or creating the artwork, and then they end up doing 80% of 80 or 90% of the work. Um, the creating the artwork uh, should be a collaborative process, and that means delegating different parts of the task. So in the kind of traditional industry model of comic art, you'd have someone who does a rough who does the penciling, so creates the artwork originally. Someone else might do the inking to make the black lines or whatever on top of that. Someone, a third person might do the coloring and a fourth person might do the lettering. So you divide that labor, that's how the industry traditionally has worked. Um, I would kind of, I recommend doing that among you, uh, your group as well. Um, that said, that can be challenging logistically because you have to take a file and then transfer it to someone else and then they have to do something and then they transfer it to someone else. And if those transfers aren't going smoothly, or efficiently, that can really bog you down too. So uh, think about what you're interested in and discuss it among your group um, and figure out how you're going to approach this. I do recommend a team leader because this is someone that I can contact if I have a, a question or see an issue. Um, also, that can be the, the person who contacts me if there is an issue. Um, also, the team leader can manage that workflow of uh, pencil to ink to color to lettering uh, or whatever your let workflow happens to be. A leader can be the one kind of reminding people what they're supposed to do, giving them, the, you know, or, or even just like creating the central repository for those files or whatever you want to do. Um, so that, you know, there's that, um, the idea, you know, because this is a web comic, you have to think about how to get it on the web. And one, uh, one pitfall, another common thing that um, happens is that uh, when you create artwork in a lot of these graphics programs, you might end up with an enormous image at the end. And that's great in terms of having a high quality, high resolution image. Um, that's not great in terms of web hosting. So I'm already well above um, uh, the, the, the WordPress site that I've created for web comics is I think might be the largest in terms of memory site, uh, like uh, might be the largest site in terms of memory used on UMW domains right now. Um, it's certainly up in the top 10. Uh, it's, um, I, I mean, it, it's like three gigabytes of, of comic images. So it's a lot, or maybe more actually by now. Um, uh, so, do me a favor and try to make those, do me and your reader a favor by making those uh, a more reasonable image size. And that's what I mean by digital proofing. Just kind of make sure that it's it's no more than like 
1200 pixels wide. I mean, that's already pretty big, but when you're creating these programs with Photoshop or Medibang or whatever, you might export it, it might be 5000 pixels wide. Um, and so like, that's too much. So anyway, these are the kinds of things that we can work through and I can help uh, guide, especially the digital person, whoever that happens to be. Uh, if you are really interested in the, writer, in the, in the writing, um, you might also find that it's useful for you to do the lettering as well because uh, uh, an, another pitfall that I've seen is sometimes a writer or writers um, have a uh, too ambitious ideas. <laughs> Their ideas are too big to fit into a single page or, or a, an, an instructions for a single panel are just too much to draw or to, to write. Um, you tend to overwrite the dialogue. So, um, you know, you have to make sure you're communicating well and working with each other to produce something that's actually producible, like it can actually be done. Uh, so I'm kind of talking through these things and it's, it's, a, it's a bit hard to get your head around until you've sort of talked with your group and tried to see who can do what. Um, and the proposal is meant to be your opportunity to do that or your reason for having that conversation. So uh, it should be prepared like a, like a report or like a, like a formal proposal, right? So think of this as a kind of technical writing um, with the, the basic overview is kind of your prospectus. Um, think of these, each of these five things as like a heading, like a section in a document. Um, I'd recommend just, you know, work on a Google Doc so you can collaborate on it. Um, and then uh, send that to me by the, the, what did I say, the fifth? Yeah, by the fifth. So once I've got those, I will reach out to each group and schedule a time when I can meet with you as a group. So this would be like where, um, the uh, the groups are, that's a good question, Corellia. I, I can look for one. I don't know if, I mean, there, it's, I, I probably had to de, I probably have to anonymize it, right? I mean, I, I wouldn't want to give you a prior student's work without their permission. So I don't have, I don't have permission to share those, um, but I can maybe, maybe I could hack, I could make one. Like, you know, maybe, maybe I could take a couple and then combine them into something that represents the idea of a good proposal. Um, so yeah, that's a good idea, Crelly. I'll, I'll see if I can do that. Um, but yeah, think of these as headings and then fill these in. Yeah, okay, I see you all already kind of talking to each other and doing some coordination, so that's great. Um, good I, I don't, but I can make one. Um, yes, Kyler, it's the same as, as your, yes, right, so uh, Kyler, you are an X, X men X person, <laughs> whatever, X, you know what I mean, you're in the X-Men group, Kyler, and you can tell by clicking on your name in Discord, and you are assigned a role that is your group name, so check that out if you have any questions. Okay, so, um, yeah, in terms of the actual thing, um, uh, I mentioned Comic Easel. That's a way that people like to pick, take it online. Uh, Instagram is also an option. So uh, I, I wanted to show you. Um, oh man, I got I have so much to talk about, and I have, I need to wrap this part of this class up because I want to talk about some things. Let me just briefly show you. You can publish this some other way if you don't want to use Comic Easel. Um, I would like to you know have a conversation about what you want to do, but certainly Instagram is an option. Um, so this is the four girls who did theirs. Um, there's called I Hate Halloween and they did each panel essentially as an image. So it's like when you upload, uh, like on Instagram, you can upload multiple images at once. Each image is essentially like a panel and you can kind of click through it that way. And I thought this worked really well as a way to deliver this content. So, you know, if this is something you'd like to do as well, then I, I currently endorse it. And here's an example of how you might do it. Um, I've, I've seen, and I follow several comic artists who do this uh, a lot. So it's something that exists and that you're you're being part of just like web comics exist and you're um, you're doing that uh, as well if you do it on comic easel okay so i think you guys are looks like you all are chatting in your channels that's good i'm trying to see like all these pop-ups coming up and i think it's you all chatting so i'm going to hold on i'm going to turn off my notifications so i stop seeing those little pop-ups it's distracting me okay so i'm going to get into to watchman chapter five if you do have questions about the web comic uh, let me know all right so chapter five uh, of watchman I've tried to make a little play on words here, V for very symmetrical, punning on V for Vendetta, which is what uh, Alan Moore's other graphic novel, one of his other graphic novels. Uh, so uh, let me just go over a few things about this, just in terms of the, the plot for chapter five. I continue to refer to it as chapter V, by the way, and um, I, I mean, I like, I mean, that's how they are literally titled in the book. 
um, with the Roman numerals, but the V here does some extra work besides simply indicating the number five. And you can actually see it in this panel right here in the center. So this is from the center of the chapter. The center page of the chapter has this structure where the large V for Adrian Veidt, uh, this is at his office building, um, goes across the spine of the pages. And so that V forms a symmetrical center to this chapter, which is a, a hint about what is going to come in terms of uh, how we can analyze this chapter. All right, so in terms of, you know, the other, other things in the plot, uh, Rorschach visits Malek uh, twice and um, wants to threaten him and then uh, on the, upon a second visit discovers that Malek is dead. Uh, Laurie and Dan continue to kind of fumble towards um, uh, living together, I guess, awkwardly. Uh, Ozymandias survives an assassination attempt. Uh, Ozymandias, Adrian White, same person. As you can see here, this is the actual assassination attempt where he uh, kills the person who is attempting to assassinate him. Or he, as he, well, it's the next page over actually, but the uh, assassin um, takes a, a, a cyanide tablet, I think, and, and, and uh, kills himself before he can be um, can explain who he is and why he's there. Uh, and then, of course, Rorschach is captured and his identity is revealed, or his, his, uh, the face that we associate with him, the inkblot face, is removed and we get to see his actual face. So uh, those are the big things going on in terms of plot. And um, I mean, there's a number of, this is a really pivotal chapter. This is a very much a turning point chapter. Uh, so if you have any questions about the significance of different things happening here, it's okay to ask so that we can be clear about how things um, proceed from now on. Uh, whereas chapters three and four, a lot of that was kind of background setting up the conflict. Now things really kick off and start um, going into motion here. So we, uh, we see Rorschach here. Rorschach is revealed, um, the, the, the mask is removed, and we see him. Um, I think this is a really interesting uh, revelation because it's like, who is he? Like, he's revealed, and it's like, usually when a character's identity, a character's unmasked, we're like, oh, it's him. It was him all along. Um, but you see this face, and you might think, who is this? Um, have I seen this person before? Uh, we will learn that in chapter six, yes, we have seen this person before. Uh, we will see him a lot. And just a spoiler alert, uh, not spoiler alert, because it's revealed very quickly, but he's, um, uh, we have seen him uh, in almost every chapter so far. Uh, possibly every chapter so far, um, he's the person on the street carrying the, the end is near sign. Uh, so he's um, he's someone who we've seen a lot but have not realized who we were seeing. Uh, in any case, we, when we see his face revealed, I think there is a kind of shock because of how intense like the artwork here is. Um, you know, but there's no sort of shock of revelation because it's not someone we know or we don't realize that we know this person. We don't recognize this face. At least I didn't the first time I read it. I was like, what? Okay, who is he? Um, so yeah, this is him. And this this idea of um, revealing the face behind the mask, that becomes the big theme in chapter six. And we'll talk some more about that. Okay, so the big overall motif of chapter six is symmetry. The chapter is titled Fearful Symmetry, and that is on purpose, and I will talk about why. Um, but like I said, I, with every chapter, I mean, there seems to be, um, I think almost every chapter, so far anyway, there's, there's one dominant motif that really characterizes what's going on in the chapter. Often has to do with other things, or, or maybe it could even just be a gimmick, but whatever it is, it's there to um, you know, make us aware of things we might not have noticed otherwise. So uh, the theme for this chapter is symmetry. And this page over here, what I have on the, on the screen right here, this is a couple of pages uh, next to each other to help you understand and see what, you know, to see this idea of symmetry. So I'm gonna try to show you this and I'm gonna see if I can pull up my dot cam and make this look sort of, sort of okay. All right, so, um, so you should do this too. Everyone get out your copy of Watchmen. All right, so I'm gonna try to do this awkwardly here because I have, I really need to, I've actually started working on and almost done with a much bigger desk that I can use for these broadcasts when I'm teaching. But okay, everyone get out your copy of Watchmen and follow along because this is gonna be kind of fun. Okay, so let me flip mine over here. See the right page, here we go. So here's the center of the chapter and that's what I showed you in the, um, in the slide there. Okay, so everyone cool? Everyone see this? So what's going on? Is there another question? No, okay, good. So yeah, I mean, so everyone pay attention. This is pretty cool. So this is uh, chapter five, check this out. So I'm going to turn one page this way and one page this way. 
All right, so it's kind of hard to see, but take a look at the panel structure, right? So the panel structure here is, uh, in both of these pages, the, the, uh, the verso and the recto, so this is, this is, uh, this is verso, this is recto, um, they are the same. In this case, it's a nine panel grid. You might think, well, that's not that special, um, right? Lots of pages here are nine panels, but check this out. This is where we have the, the Black Raider text interspersed with the overarching narrative. And here we have sort of newsstand, Black Raider, newsstand. Here we have Black Raider, newsstand, Black Raider. And so there is a um, complementary pattern throughout both of these pages. So they, it's like a checkerboard. Uh, but the opposite checkerboard, right? Okay, so let's move. This is a bit more easier to see here. This is the one that I assembled on the slides. Here we have one, two, three, one, one, two, three. Then we have on the recto we have one, two, three, one, one, two, three. So looking at the at the hyperframe, remember that was Gronstein's term for the overall grid of the page. Uh, the hyperframes throughout this chapter are symmetrical, and you can you can see these for certain pairs like this, but it's also the same for like. 11 and um, 18. So take your page right now, take your, your copy and try to do this. See if you can go from the center outward and see what you notice as further examples of this symmetrical pattern. You can't see it at the same time, but this one where's the ocean there, there's the shark there, um, same page uh, layout there. Here's another example. Um, in this case, the content is also pretty similar. You have uh, Rorschach arriving at Moloch's apartment, so you have him leaving, or you have him arriving again uh, for his second visit, and the same color color pattern uh, persists throughout these, but again, ultimately, the, uh, once you notice, the hyperframes are mirror images across each other, across the, the, the spine uh, of the chapter, right? And then here we see, are we in the right pages? Yeah, so Fearful Symmetry, the title. Um, the title is a reference to a William Blake poem, which we'll talk about uh, next, but I'm trying to keep these sort of a line in the center of vision so you can see both pages at once. It's kind of tricky to do on a dot cam, but it's working, I think, I hope. Do you all see what I'm, do you all see this? I mean, do you see what I'm doing here? Uh, similar sort of inverted checkerboard pattern, except here we have the same, the light and the dark. Um, I don't know if it's clear from the context, but that the change of light there uh, that we see every time anyone's in Moloch's apartment at night is the big sign out front um, blinking on and off. And you can see the reflection of the sign right here in this puddle. That reflection is itself a mirror, and in that mirror we see this this uh, symbol, the RR, uh, which are which is uh, also symmetrical, and it's an R with a mirrored R, so it's it's symmetrical across it, but it also is, looks like a skull, it's meant to look like a skull and crossbones for pirates. And here we see uh, this uh, backstory. The backstory for this chapter, the the appendix part for this chapter, has to do with the the history of the Black Raider and its writer, uh, Joe Orlando. And, uh, or is that, he's the artist. Yeah, he's uh, Orlando's the artist for, for Black Raider. Uh, we also see the, the writer uh, later on. So, yeah, so that's uh, obviously something that was done on purpose. It's something that um, Alan Warren, Dave Gibbons planned on doing. Uh, I think the, the evidence is very clear that this chapter has to do with symmetry. Um, I mean, there's, there are examples of, uh, mirroring throughout this and let me show you kind of what I mean. So if you look at pages 10 and page 19 together, right? So page 10 and 19 um, and let's see if I can do it like this. There you go. So what you might not notice at first as you look at these, of course they are the two pages themselves mirror each other, right? Um, also, if you'll notice, we are actually looking in a mirror in each of these panels. So we're looking at Dan looking at Laurie. We're also in here, we're looking at Dan looking at Laurie. But in either case, we are kind of like an invisible camera in the room taking a picture of what we see in the mirror of that. So here we see behind Laurie, but we also see her front reflected in the mirror. So that's the mirror here. Um, same kind of thing here where we're seeing, we're seeing what Dan sees because it's reflected in the mirror behind him. If that makes sense. So uh, the idea of mirrors and reflection and symmetrical pairings of reflections is pervasive in this chapter. It shows up again and again and again. Um, see if you can find an example. So see if you can, you know, sort of like a, it, like the other motifs in these chapters, it becomes almost an Easter egg kind of thing. So um, see if you can find another example of symmetry or reflection or 
uh, mirroring happening in this chapter. And let me know, like uh, post it in the live stream channel if you if you find an example, especially if you think an example find an example that's interesting. All right. Either in a single page or some kind of significance that goes across pages or in a single panel even. Um, tell me what you notice as examples of the mirroring, mirroring theme or the reflection theme, uh, basically the symmetry. And just call it out by page number um, and panel number if you can. Uh, the other, uh, I was going to mention, I, I finally did find my archive of every panel. Um, I, it was on a hard drive, but I had to find the cord for that hard drive. And so I have it now on this computer that I'm streaming from, and I will upload it somewhere. I think it's going to be too big of a file to put into Canvas. And also there's copyright issues, so I might just put it on Google Drive or something. Um, but in case you are interested, it's actually really interesting sometimes to compare the coloring between those. So I will put something together to compare those um, at some point. It looks like Sed and Sarah are typing. I mean, it just like every page, basically, you could find something. I'm sure. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I mean, just kind of as a, you know, just a quick example, hopefully I'm not taking someone else's that you're talking, but take a look at the shark down here. The shark down here um, is being reflected vertically across the, the water there. And then that reflection creates kind of a circle there. And then that circle triangle face shape gets picked up in this guar poster. So it's, um, yeah, I mean, we see an echo there or, see, or reflection, you know, panel to panel, but we also see the vertically, so horizontal, but also vertically, we see that reflection. All right, so there's a similar kind of horizontal versus vertical and reflecting going on just in that center page. Quite a lot actually of interplay here. So perhaps this is what you're looking at. So let me see if I can, what are you all talking about? Um, yeah, so right, so said good point said it's like um, it, it's it's the the in, inversion of it, right? Like he's laying he's the ambusher in the first scene and then he's the ambushy in the second scene. So that, that symmetry there exists at the narrative level too. That's a great point. Um, okay, page 12, panel 8. Let's see. Page. That's like a weird printing error on this page. Okay, so page 12, panel 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Oh, yeah, yeah. So this uh, picture of him looking at himself or or is it himself? And I think that's one of these questions as you look at it. He's like, um, he's looking down. It kind of looks like he's looking at his reflection. He probably is, but he identifies it um as uh, like he take he doesn't recognize himself as for at first like he thinks it's one of the corpses that he's tied to the bottom of his raft raft right so I think that's the case anyway uh, right so he sees himself but he doesn't recognize himself and that's a, that's going to be a big theme in chapter six I feel like. All right, anyone else? Like, uh, I'm seriously, there's, there are like literally dozens in here, so I'd like to hear some more. So let me know what you noticed. Here's a, here's a pages 14 and 15. Um, have quite a bit. This is the center of the, uh, of the, uh, the center image. I already mentioned the way the recto verso structure here kind of highlights the V, the symmetry, symmetry of the V. And I feel like this is like the big clue that they leave, that the artists leave for us to, to be able to, uh, to start looking for this thing, right? That we, like if we noticed, we probably noticed this, and then we're like, oh wait, actually these these two pages look very similar to each other and are symmetrical. And then oh, let's see if we can keep going. And then you, that I think that's their kind of clue, but I don't I don't think I noticed it the first time I read this. Uh, I'm pretty sure I didn't. Okay, 17 page, panel nine. Yeah, yeah. So we have this. This is this one here, right? So. Mm -hmm. We see the reflection across the water. The reflection of the, of the setting sun makes a circle. Almost echoes the, the smiley face motif. Uh, the face, page 13, panel 1. Yeah, so we see her reflection. Good point. And we also see the V, too. Like, so the V gives us that sense to uh, something to look for, right? Um, I don't remember her name, either. Um, but she's... Uh, very minor she's killed in the next page so she's a very minor character um other s examples of symmetry i'll give you one i'll give you some well i'll give you a few maybe depending on what you want to notice um 
Yeah, as soon as you get it right. Uh, the irony of that. Yeah, so I mean, this is this is the the kind of thing I was talking about as an Easter egg, right? So Eddie Blake is our character here, right? He's de that's through these detectives, the, the murder that they're investigating. Um, the the case file for Eddie Blake is eight oh one one oh eight. It's a palindrome. It's a number that's a palindrome. It reads the same backward and forward, um, and so that's another kind of mirror reflection um, <laughs> motif uh, playing out there. All right. Looks like Nagel Bagel's typing. Uh, maybe let's we'll see if we can get a couple more. I mean, just looking at this one, uh, I mean, the center one, uh, catch up butterfly. Yeah, yeah, so uh, this is a good one. So this, uh, just going back to the center spread here, I just wanna make sure you can see, like there's two faces, like there's actually sort of four faces here, uh, but not quite. And I think uh, I think you hopefully start noticing as you explore different examples of the symmetry, symmetry and reflection, is like the, the way the Black Raider captain sees himself but doesn't recognize himself, um, there's, there's often something wrong with the reflection. So that's what's fearful about symmetry is that it's not exact. And you can see here that there's, there's something isn't quite right. This, this face is disturbed by the water. And so it's not a perfect reflection of his face. You might have, by the way, saw this person and thought that's Rorschach. I think that's another kind of um, mistaken identity and another example of that reflection that's not quite a reflection. They do look pretty similar. Um, but they're not the same person. Uh, all right, so yeah, page 11. Yeah, so he makes a catch a butterfly. Uh, it's actually the Rorschach ink blot. So if you think of, you know, the psychology, the psych psychiatric uh, like test, the Rorschach test, that's what that's based on. But so he's, he's, he's kind of doing that as just a compulsion basically. Um, but you should hopefully see that there's also uh, this kind of fearful symmetry, this idea of the, um, the figures in the, the, the spray paint, the graffiti here. Um, it's tricky because there's there's another kind of misrepresentation going on where sometimes you see this and you can't tell if this is an actual reflection or if this is a graffiti of a, a silhouette and that idea of misrecognition of a misrecognition of symmetry like a shadow should be an echo of the thing that it's a shadow of but it isn't always and it isn't quite there um, likewise when we see this, it's drawn exactly the same way as it would be if that was actually someone's shadow because it's just black ink on a page. Um, and then, you know, likewise, we see the black ink of Rorschach's face on the page, um, meaning the same thing. So Kyler pointed out page 18, panel seven, um, Rorschach's face is always symmetrical. Um, and I would actually just add almost, uh, almost always symmetrical. Um, the one panel in this, this chapter where it's not symmetrical is right here on the last page where he gets kicked in the face and the ink blots move over to the side. That is the moment where his identity is destroyed. So, right, that's, that's like he, he thinks of that mask as his real face. Um, it is no longer symmetrical at this point and that's when he ceases to be Rorschach, uh, you might say. So this, uh, this, as soon as the sym symmetry breaks down, Rorschach's identity breaks down. Um, there's a lot more to say about Rorschach. Chapter six is really an exploration of Rorschach. Um, I just wanted to take uh, the last few minutes here because, um, and, and keep if you keep noticing examples, uh, feel free to find them, especially if you find them where it's a, it's a reflection, but not quite, right? So there's, um, if you think of the opening and closing scenes here, uh, Rorschach's very much in control in the first scene. He very much loses control in the end, uh, the second scene, and the reflection of that first scene. And so this idea of symmetry, but not quite being symmetrical is what I want you to pay attention for. So let's take a look at where this comes from. So the, the quote at the end of the chapter, most chapters end with a quote, I think all of them actually end with a quote, and uh, often that is a play on whatever the title is. And so for this one, it's uh, the, the title is Fearful Symmetry, and that phrase uh, invites us to think about like what's actually, what is, what is fearful about symmetry? Like why is that a fearful thing? Uh, William Blake is the, uh, the origin of this, uh, of this quote or this phrase. It comes from his poem, The Tiger. And this is, on this slide I have two, um, actually let me switch my, I forgot to switch my dot cam off. On this slide I have two different versions of the tiger. Um, the tiger is a, an illuminated text, meaning um, that Blake published this in the form that you see here. Um, he had his own kind of unique printing process and so the way that it printed out was a little different each time and that's an important thing to consider, which I'll, I'll show you. Um, you can look at all, all the examples together here. Um, this is from his book, Songs of Innocence and Experience, and this is a collection of poems where there is, in each 
there's two sections of it, Songs of Innocence, and then there's Songs of Experience. And there, for most of those poems, there's a, there's a pair, there's a symmetrical pair. So uh, the tiger is an echo or symmetrically paired with the lamb from the, um, from the first one. The little, and the lamb is like a sweet little poem. It's like little lamb, little lamb who made thee, little lamb, little lamb, God bless thee. It's, it's almost a, like a, it's like a lot of Blake things. There's sort of a, a sweet kind of um, uh, lullaby kind of level of it. But then there's also like weird dark hints at something else going on. Uh, so even the songs of innocence for Blake are not innocent uh, necessarily. So uh, the tiger is another kind of thing that isn't quite what it seems at first. And that's often what ha what happens with Blake. So let's take a look at this poem. Actually, oops, um, let's go back there. Uh, so I have this a link here to the William Blake archive. So if you're not familiar with Blake, uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of books. <laughs> Obviously, you can uh, study the uh, let's see. Yes, yeah, so this is how we do it. The, the site is kind of it takes a little practice, but um, you can browse multiple versions of each artifact. And um, actually, let me read the poem, and then I'll show you some of the different versions. All right, so it goes like this. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? Tree, symmetry. In what distant deep, deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? What the hammer, what the chain, in what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil, what dread grasp, dare its deadly terrors clasp? When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night, what immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? Um, a lot going on in that poem. It's a very short poem. It has a kind of sing-song kind of rhythm to it, but it's got this really... Uh, terrifying imagery in it um, and also it it implies I think pretty clearly that this t the tiger is this demonic being created not by God but by something else something other than God and that's a thing you see a lot in in Blake's work um, other creator beings that create chaos instead of order and so this is uh, possibly a work of that kind of creator like uh, Urizen is a creator that you see a lot um, a lot going on here in the poem. So notice that the word that I tripped on when I was reading it is the word symmetry. The word that actually means things being the same is the thing is the word that breaks the rhyme scheme of this poem. So it's a half rhyme. It kind of works. It kind of doesn't, and it kind of forces you to stumble over it like that. And that I think is what Blake wants us to notice about symmetry being fearful. Um, he resists it being perfect, and that breaking down of perfect symmetry is what's what he wants us to notice. Um, other things, the, the opening and closing stanza are almost the same, but not quite. Notice that the last line of the first stanza is could frame thy fearful symmetry. The last line of the last stanza is dare frame thy fearful symmetry. Um, he's talking about framing here, and even though, of course, he's not quoting Grunstein, uh, I think the idea of Grunstein's framing might be something we could think about in terms of the visual presentation of this poem, because it is, uh, it is a, a verbal visual work. Uh, it is an image text, and, and it's meant to be he meant it to be published together like this. You can often read this poem just by itself, and it's a well-known poem. Um, the, you know, the text is is you know delightful or, or scary or whatever you take from it. But the uh, the presentation of it on this page is how Blake intended it to exist. It's a it's a painting uh, or an engraving uh, more so than a uh, just a poem. And I think that's important because of the tiger itself. And in many versions of it, uh, you get. A tiger that looks kind of like the one on the right here, and I'll, I'll zoom in. Uh, I'll show you a, a zoomed-in version of this tiger uh, here, if I can. Let's see. I don't know if this will work that well. Hopefully, you can see that um, the tiger has a face that I can only describe as kind of dorky and silly. Um, very, uh, I guess, you know, kind of smiling and kind friendly. Um, you know, not necessarily that fearful. <laughs> and um, if you look at it, it, so again, there's. So Blake would create um, like a master like engraving and then would run different prints of it. And those different prints that have different chemicals and things that would change the look of it. So if you compare just these two tigers, uh, this tiger looks 
uh, fearful, like this tiger looks scared. Um, and whereas this one seems like he's having a good time, um, this one, uh, the one on the right here is, is not. <laughs> and uh, some of that subtlety that might be accidental or it might be intentional, um, but it, you know, if, if nothing else, it demonstrates just how expressive a face can be and how different, how different you can make that expression just by changing a few, uh, a few lines and features. Here's another terrified looking tiger. Um, I can I can pop these out, but like there's no way within this website for me to link directly to this page that has all these comparisons. So that's why I've linked in the slideshow just to the Blake archive uh, to to this view of the page. And if you want to look at, at it the way I'm doing, um, you go to um, like you select all of you select all objects from the same matrix, and then you select them all, and then you compare select the objects like I did there. I guess I could probably pull these out on my own. Here's another kind of mutilated looking kind of gory looking tiger. Um, you know, the body is definitely kind of strange. Let me see if I can, maybe if I click enlargement, what does this do? Oh, it pops out in a new window. I don't want to see it in a new window. Um, so yeah, and then this one kind of has almost a psychedelic look and then the X, sort of X's over his eyes. Um, uh, this one looks half asleep and you can kind of see too, the imagery, the tree changes as well. Like the tree, I'm, I'm focusing on the tiger because that's the title of the poem. Um, but the tree also kind of changes its its tone, really. Oh uh, yeah, this one. Uh, this one's very colorful, uh, very richly lined, um, but also really just lots of very different colors. <laughs> so let's see, and then finally, yeah. So these other ones, they just this one looks just kind of optimistic but worried. <laughs> this one looks just straight up. Uh, terrified so it's it, it's a very different tiger than the poem describes ultimately like some of these are pretty fearful themselves like things that you should be afraid of um, but the the tiger described in the poem never quite adds up to the tiger that we see in this image here and that that tension the idea that we would expect this to be an illustration of the poem and then that expectation is troubled by whatever we actually see there that's another example of symmetry being fearful the idea that images should be the same as text is something that Blake is here rejecting. He's, he's putting these things together to say this is a unique a unique thing and that we should not be so ready to look for symmetry and equivalence between image and text. And uh, he has there's a political project to that I think within Blake but just aesthetically uh, we can see him here uh, I, I think doing these kinds of things very much on purpose uh, between uh, between the two. So this is this is Blake. William Blake is fascinating. Um, oh yeah, there's a tiger, <laughs> the tiger version, um, uh, uh, this, this song. I'm curious about this, the tone of that song because, I mean, the tiger, this poem is, you know, it is a kind of sing-song, kind of bouncy thing, but it's also really kind of terrifying if you're thinking about what's happening here. I mean, the stars are throwing down their spears, like, what does that mean? And they're watering heaven with their tears? This doesn't sound good, like, it sounds like an apocalypse, like, this doesn't sound like, um, you know, God uh, doing something, and it sounds like like an attack by an alien invading force or something. Um, and I mean, that's William Blake for you. Like that's that's where you can go. You can go with William Blake. Um, so this idea of symmetry uh, and symmetry, but not quite, and a reflection, but not a perfect reflection. Um, this is the this is I think uh, the the meaning of this motif within this work uh, within Watchmen. Like you start to see this and you start to see how, how the troubling of a mirror or the troubling of a reflection um, brings us closer to understanding the characters, but also you know, thinking about the overall system. Um, there's an interesting, there's an essay I'd like to uh, direct your attention to. Uh, let me kind of wrap this up. Yeah, um, since we're getting low on time, let me just direct you to this. Um, this is an essay by Roger Whitson, and this is an essay from a journal of uh, comic studies. Uh, oops. The, um, you know what? I need to tell them about this. <laughs> okay. Uh, I just really, I just, sorry, I'm getting distracted because I, I did the layout for this website um, many, many years ago when I was in grad school, and they really need to change the way that those titles are rendered because it uses Flash, and Flash will stop working in like a month. Um, anyway, so this is a po uh, an essay, and I would like for you to take a look at this essay because it explores the significance of the symmetrical theme. So now that I've shown you how to, th how to see it in the comic and I've given you the reference from Blake, I'd like for you to take a look at this to try to understand what to do with this, like how a literary theorist takes these ideas and then explains them in the context of a critical point of view. Uh, specifically, uh, he talks about the tiger here 
and then talks about the chapter here and points out some of the things I pointed out as well, um, but some others, um, and you know, um, you probably noticed additional examples of symm symmetry and reflection. So I would like you to look at this essay and see if uh, it teaches you something that you didn't know before or introduces you to a new idea. Ultimately, the question we should always ask about scholarship about comics is, um, how do I see the comic differently after I've read it? So um, please take a look at this essay and let me know what you think, um, especially when we talk about chapter six on Wednesday. I'm, I'll be interested to see if you can extend any of the ideas about chapter five into a deeper understanding of chapter six. So please take a look at that. The link is in, uh, it's in the schedule actually in Canvas or on uh, the website, I guess. And it's, um, it's linked in the, the slideshow that I sent you all a link to uh, a minute ago. Okay, so Rose Tyler, I am kind of curious about your version of the tiger, but I'll, I guess I will ask you about that on Wednesday. Um, all right, well, thanks for, everyone, uh, thanks for watching everyone. I'm going to wrap it up here. I will archive this on YouTube as I usually do, and I will be in touch uh, various ways. If you have any questions about your proposals, uh, let me know. Otherwise, I will see some of you on Wednesday and some others on Friday. So, bye.